So let, let's read the passage that's before us then. Um, and uh, we, we start to read at verse number 5 of Romans 6. For if we have been united with him, that is with Christ, in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. For one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we've died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So, you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. Amen. May God's word uh, touch our hearts today. So um, this morning, we're, we're going to be thinking about this new life that, that Christians have. Um, you, 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 you saw how... Um, last week's verse finished off, the end of verse 4, where he talks about that you might walk in newness of life. Christians have a new life, and that life, that new life, has to be lived. It has to be lived out. So, the Christian life, therefore, by definition, is, is not a revamped life. It's not a makeover job. It's not the fact that it's been kind of uh, refurbished or it's a home improvement. It's, it's a brand new life. And that new life has to be lived out. Now, of course, this time of the year, we're all very acquainted with this whole idea of new year, um, new life, or, or new life for this new year. We were walking down today and we saw, it has to be said, people who were not exactly svelte, um, pounding the streets with their yellow vests on, obviously their new year resolution to be their new self is to be fitter. And uh, we've all thought about the diets and all the rest of it. I was speaking to somebody today who's about to head off for a new life on the other side of the world in New Zealand very shortly. I'm reading a book just now, actually, and uh, it's about a guy recounting his upbringing in the, the poverty of the Deep South in America. Um, not just poverty, but uh, racism and prejudice and, and ignorance. And uh, he describes the day he left and he went to college and how he says it felt as though the cell door had been opened for him. <laughs> and, uh, and, he, and he was gaining freedom out of all of that. And it was like a new life was, was beginning. Now we understand all of these things when people talk about a new start, a new life, a new beginning. But, but we really are talking about that when it comes to the Christian life. Now we, we remember the story about, for instance, Nicodemus. And, and when Jesus spoke to him at night and said, you must be born again. You must be born of God. You must be born from above. And we're acquainted with the teaching of Christ regarding the new birth. 
So what actually happens is a Christian has a new life altogether. Now that's not a corny statement. It's not even a political phrase, being born again. It's a Bible truth. I remember reading a number of years ago um, about the Watergate scandal. Nixon, of course, was impeached, lost his presidency. Many of his henchmen and his staff members were imprisoned. There was a chap called Charles Colson who was known as Nixon's hatchet man, and he uh, did all the dirty work for him, and he was imprisoned. And in prison, with his life all falling around about him, he came to faith in Christ through the witness of, uh, of a senator. And uh, he began to write down his, his life story and his experiences in a book. And, uh, of course, at the end of the book, he began to think, well, what am I going to call this book? And his initial thought was to call it Born Again. And he thought, I, mean, I can't do that. It just is so corny. It's so cheesy. And there are political ramifications to this. But as he actually thought about it, he said, I can't get away from this. This has to be the title of the book that I, I, I write because it really just says it all as far as my life is now concerned. I've got a new life now. I have been born again. It is a new life. And that's what he did entitle his book. Now, I want you to see that this is, this is what this passage is talking about today. It is talking about, and uh, notice it, the Christian life is being described, this new life, in two ways. In a negative sense and in a positive sense. Negatively, Christian people have died with Christ. The old life is gone. Jesus has dealt with their sins upon the cross. Praise God. But that's not the whole story. The second part of it is Christian people have a new life. They are alive to God. Now let me just again point out some of the phrases in our reading. Verse number 5. We will certainly be united with Christ in a resurrection like his. Verse 8. We believe that we will also live with him. Verse 11. Alive to God in Christ Jesus. Verse 13, you have been brought from death unto life. There's no getting away from it. That's what it's described as, a new life. And this life has to be lived out. Now that is the expectation. Now as we read down this, you might have thought, well this is quite technical you know, this is not straightforward. This is perhaps a little bit heavy for us to get our heads round about. But uh, if you think about it, imagine the people to whom this is being read in Rome. I mean, the majority of them wouldn't have had the same level of formal education as you and I have had. I mean, many of them would just have been normal people, servants, slaves, some of them soldiers, sailors, maybe even candlestick makers. They're just normal, run-of-the-mill, rank-and-file people across the whole spectrum of society. The occasional noble people were there as well, but the bulk are ordinary folk. And the expectation is that they will understand what this means. They will know what this passage is about when it talks about living out this new life. And this is not for them some idea. It's not just some academic theory that is being tossed around in the salons of Rome, you know, by the intelligentsia. This is a real message for real people who've come to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and who Paul is now trying to explain to them, this new life that you have received, you've died with Christ, but you have been raised with Christ. The resurrection power of Christ is something that is resident within you. And I want to explain to you what that means, he's saying. 
And I want you to learn to live out this new life. So this is real life stuff that we have here. Now, Paul speaks about this virtually in every single one of his letters, not just in this one. And in fact, some of his colleagues, his fellow apostles, they also speak about it. So this is not just some kind of peripheral message. It's a very central thing. And let me give you a couple of illustrations of that. Um, you might want to turn to First Peter uh, and chapter 3. So here's Peter, and he's writing one of his letters. And uh, he, he is putting this new life in a, in a kind of negative form. And what he says in First Peter and in uh, chapter 4 and verse number 3 is this. For the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do, living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery and they malign you. So uh, here they all are in the office one day, chatting around about the table. And um, they're talking about the weekend coming and what the plans are. And uh, the Christian person that Peter's writing to says, I won't, be, uh, I won't be coming along. I'm not going to get involved in this. And they're surprised. They're surprised. Maybe there comes a point where they are no longer surprised. But the reality of it is this. The expectation is, as far as this new life that this person now has after believing in Christ, is that they, negatively, they do not live in that same way as they used to live. So that's it stated negatively by Peter. But uh, there's somebody else. There's John, one of the other ones. So if you turn to First John, um, and in chapter 2... He puts things in a positive light. And this is, this is how he phrases it in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6. Whoever says he abides in him, that is in Christ, ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Now that, that, that is the expectation on the positive side. So we know how Jesus walked. We know, we know how he lived his life. And the expectation is for the Christian who has Jesus living within them, who is united to Jesus by faith, that they will live their lives in the same way as Jesus lived. The qualities and characteristics of their life will increasingly take on those of the Christ who lives within them. Now, that is a challenge, isn't it? But this is the teaching that we have from Scripture. And he goes on to maybe expand on that a wee bit, John, in chapter 3 and verse 9, where he says this, No one born, there's that idea of life, no one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. Now that's not to say that Christians don't fall and stumble and make mistakes and sin occasionally. But you, you'll notice the phraseology here. It's all about the practice of sin, about keeping on sinning habitually because the life, the seed of Christ is within them and changes them as they live this, this new life. And that's why, you, for instance, you'll, you'll get somebody who encounters Christ. Well, let's think of one who did. Let's think of Zacchaeus. You remember? The tax collector, the quizzling, the betrayer of his people. And when he encounters the Lord Jesus, who said, Zacchaeus, I, I've come to seek and to save those who were lost. And Zacchaeus says, well, that's me. And um, he came to his house. And, and Zacchaeus says, Lord, if, if I have defrauded anybody, 
I'm, I'm going to repay them four times. And uh, I'm going to give away now half of everything that I possess to the poor in this area. What's happening? He's somebody who's got this new life and is beginning to live out this new life that he has in Christ. So that, that's, what we're, that's what we're talking about today from, from Romans chapter 6. It's not an obscure passage. It's not technically difficult. It is in terms of the whole of the tenor of our Bibles and of our New Testament. Now, I've got, I've got four words that I'm going to just highlight, which I found helpful in just trying to get my head round about some of the key concepts that are involved in living this new life. So the, the first word is the word united. And we're not talking about football uh, this morning. But you'll see that this word uh, comes out of our passage. Uh, you'll see that in verse number 5. If we have been united with him in a death like his, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. So the point I'm, I'm making here is that this new life is only received through being united spiritually with Jesus Christ by faith in him. All right? you, do, you do not receive that life in any other way. You don't receive it by religiously trying to reform yourself, doing things that are good, you know, giving to charity, being a good neighbor, taking communion, being involved in prayer meetings, whatever, becoming a member of the church. You know? None of that does it. The only thing that does it is union spiritually with Jesus Christ, who is the Savior. Now, what do we mean by being united with Christ? You know what it means? Sometimes you might read a book, as I've been doing this week, and uh, some of the things that are mentioned, some of the stuff that's expressed, the ideas, the thoughts that people have, you think, yeah, I, I can connect with that. Uh, there's a bit of a meeting of minds here. I, I, I get that. And, and you feel you have a connection with the individual or with the character. Now, that's not what we mean when we think of being united or connected to Christ. It's not just, oh, yes, I understand that. Uh, that appeals to me. Um, it's, it's a spiritual oneness that you have with Christ. Christ is in you. I mean, that's what Jesus said. Whoever believes in me, me and my Father, the Spirit of God, we will come and we will make our home within you. And on the other hand, it is me being in Christ. Christ in me and I in Christ. I am incorporated spiritually, united to Christ in the same way as my body is united to my brain and my head. Now, there's always a, there's a part in the Old Testament I always think about. It talks about Christ in you, the hope of glory in Colossians. And um, you might remember the story of Jacob, old Jacob and uh, Joseph in Egypt. And he thinks he's going to lose his son Benjamin as well. And, and the brothers say, you know, the old man's life is just completely wrapped up, wrapped up in the life of his son, Benjamin. If anything happens to Benjamin, he will be affected by that. Their, their, their lives are intertwined. They're, they're united in that sense. Now, that's exactly the case. Christians have been spiritually united to Christ in his death in that their sins are dealt with. They're united to Christ in his resurrection because they once were dead they have been given new life they're alive now to God where previously they were separated from God and that is the union and it comes by faith and nothing else so that's the first point the second point that I'd like to, to make is more about the idea of, of how, now that I understand how I receive this new life, 
How can I live it out and develop that? And um, I, I, I think there are three, another three key words in the passage that, that have helped me. Now, that's not to say that it's some kind of you know, quick, fi- quick fix type of thing. Three you know, key steps to this, and it's, it's all very simple and straightforward and happens you know, as you snap your fingers. I mean, when you come to chapter 7, and, and, you, and you encounter Paul um, and his struggle with sin, you realize it's not an easy thing. But nevertheless, there are principles that, that are very helpful and crucial when it comes to this. And if we have the next word up, the next word is uh, the word know. We know. So you'll see that, for instance, in, in verse number 6. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. So what he's saying is this. There are certain things in the past, facts, things that have happened, we know these things. They are certainties. This is not fantasy we're talking about. These are definite things. I mean, he even talks about some of the historical things that we know as far as Jesus himself is concerned. So, for instance, verse 9, we know that Christ being raised from the dead will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. We know that. That happened. But equally, we also know that certain things have happened to us. I know my sin is gone. I've died. And I know that I have been now raised with Christ. And I'm in the heavenly places, as he wrote to the, to the Ephesians. My, my, my feet are squarely on terra firma, but spiritually speaking, you know, my, my life is hid with Christ and God. My citizenship is in heaven. And that's where my life is drawn from. And uh, this is not just a kind of psychological game. You know, it's not like some athlete who is about to run his race and, you know, he reads his little, you see the tennis players and they've got their little key messages in between the games that they remind themselves about and they psych themselves up and they say, you know, hit it harder down the middle or whatever. And, and, and they, they, they work themselves up and it's all this positive thinking stuff. That, that's not what he's saying. What he is saying is, this is who you are. Remember that. Know that. This is what happened to you when you placed your faith in Christ. This is who you are. This is your identity. This is what defines you. You know, this is you. Know that. Remember that. Be clear about that. Now, that's a very, very key point for us to continually do this as Christian people, to remember who you are and what has been done for you and what you now have become. To, to know this. To know this. And so, I mean, obviously, the question that needs to be asked is, do we all know this? Do we all have this certainty in our hearts that we are Christ's? And that, that God has worked in our life and he has given us this new life that's characterized by forgiveness from guilt, of peace with God, of assurance that God is my Father and I will be in heaven one day. Do, do we have that, that life, that eternal life that is through the Lord Jesus? Do, do we know that? If not, that is the big thing that needs to be settled uh, in our minds. So he says, know this. Um, j- just a few points about that verse, because I, I know I said, you know, it really is not all that technical, but the, I mean, there are a few points that do have to be just mentioned here. And one of them is this, where it says um, in verse number six, in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing. Now, that is not saying that everything about my body physically is sinful. What, what it really means is my body, which is dominated by my sinful nature, that that, 
through what Christ has done for me, that sinful nature might be nullified, might be rendered powerless, that a change takes place because of what Christ is doing uh, within me. So, so that is the, that's the first, the first word. Uh, the second word that I wanted to point out is the word consider. And you'll, you'll see that in verse number 11, where it says, So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. So you see, there's a kind of progression of thought. There's a kind of gradation here. Uh, the word is actually a, an accountancy term. Um, the idea is that, that you reckon you know, in the same way as you add things up, you count things. So what he's actually saying is, since you know these things to be true, you need, you need to do the sums as far as your life is concerned. You just need to add things up. And on the basis of these things, this is the conclusion that you now come to. You now act on what you know to be true. This is what you are. This is your identity. Now you need to be what you are. Not some fantasy. You know, not something different. This is what you are. Now be that. You need to consider yourself. Reckon yourself to be dead to sin, but alive to God. Now time's marching on here. So let me just quickly go to the last point. And the last point and the final word uh, I want to draw to your attention is the word present. Not present, but present. And you'll see that's repeated um, a few times uh, towards the end. So for instance, verse 13, do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to to God as those who have been brought from death to life. So this is the next step, if you like, in this, this progression. Know, consider, present. Now, this word present carries with it the idea of, of decision-making and of deliberate choice. So... I make a conscious decision that I will offer or I will present myself to God. You know, in the same way that in the Old Testament, the, the worshippers came to the tabernacle with their offerings, which they presented to God. They made that choice earlier in the week. They bought the animal. They made sure it was, it was fine. There was no problem with it. They chose to travel up that day. They went and they made an appointment with the priest. They got everything in order. It was premeditated. And they brought that and they made their presentation. Now, that's what we're asked to do as a, as a deliberate choice, a deliberate decision. He's saying here, present yourself. Make that presentation. You know, and it's for us in the quietness of our own hearts at times, this morning, here as we are, or, or later on, to make that presentation. And as you can see, he, he's quite specific about it. And he says, you present the members of your body as, as instruments of righteousness. And that, you know, that's where that old hymn, I'm sure, comes from. You know, take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. And, he, and the verses of that hymn go through, take my hands, take my, take my feet, take, take my mouth. And uh, of course, Scripture does all of that. It talks about all of these things. So for instance, if you were to go to Romans chapter 10, halfway down the chapter, he talks about how beautiful are the feet of those who carry the gospel. Now, personally, I don't think I have ever referred to anybody's feet as being beautiful, you know. I do the minor surgery stuff uh, 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 at, at our practice. I draw a line at doing ingrowing toenails. I can't stand feet, you know. But what we have here, feet being described as being beautiful. Beautiful feet. 
Because what are they doing? They've been offered, presented to God, and they carry the gospel to others. And he says that's a beautiful thing. Now, there are other things that are mentioned as well. You might want to turn to this one. Uh, This is in the book of uh, Ephesians in chapter 4. And he talks about a couple of things there. For instance, down in verse number 28. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he might have something to share with anyone who is in need. Hands offered, presented to God. This is living out the new life. Verse 29. Not feet or hands, but let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths, but only such as is good for building up as fits the occasion. In fact, if you go over to uh, chapter 5, it expands on that. Verse 4, let there be no filthiness, nor foolish talk, nor crude joking, which are out of place, but instead, let there be thanksgiving. Present the members of your body as instruments of righteousness to Christ. And the bottom line is this, verse 14, the last, the last verse. For sin will not have dominion over you. You people, you people there in Rome, all the different backgrounds, this new life you have, bottom line, sin is not going to have domination, mastery over you. Because sin is no longer your master. If you look earlier on in our passage, it talks about that we will no longer be enslaved to sin. Sin is not dominating. You're not the slave of sin. You've been freed from that. You're now under the the liberating authority of Christ and of His grace. It's not the law which kind of oppresses us because we can never keep its terms and we can never live up to the law and we always fall short of that the thing that now is dominating us is the kindness and goodness and love and the grace of Christ that is the thing that should dominate us and that is what should help us live out this new life that we have so I hope these key points uh, you'll think about maybe mull them over this week. I've I found them very helpful for me. They are essential. Know who you are, and what has happened to you, and what you've become, and act on that. Reckon yourself to be dead, and then present yourself decisively as instruments for righteousness. Me, God bless His word, uh, and shall we pray? Lord, thank you for the the wonderful life that Christ offers. I've come that they might have life, that they might have it more abundantly. Pray that everyone here will be a possessor of Christ's eternal life through faith in him today. And those of us who, who have this new life, which links us with Christ and his resurrection, that we live that life out in terms that we've been thinking about today. So we, we commit ourselves to you, the children, the young people, all who have been here today in your presence, worshiping you, listening to your word, that we might live lives that are devoted to you as we ask through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.